Welcome to Financial Clarity, the podcast dedicated to helping service-based small business owners achieve financial success. Join us as we demystify financial concepts, get practical tips from seasoned entrepreneurs, and discover strategies to increase profit and value. Hannah Smolinski here. I'm the host of the Financial Clarity Podcast, where I connect successful entrepreneurs, financial experts, and leaders in the small business community. Past guests include Melina Palmer, a behavioral economist who literally wrote the book on pricing called The Truth About Pricing, and Sarah Russo, a former book publishing executive who left the corporate publishing world to start a boutique literary publicity and marketing firm. So if either of those episodes sound interesting to you, please make sure and check those out. We've got a book theme today for our episode, so excited to talk to you guys. Today's episode is brought to you by my company, Clara CFO Group. Clara CFO is dedicated to providing financial clarity and profit-maximizing solutions to small businesses. The team at Clara CFO are seasoned accounting professionals with a heart for small business. We help growth-minded entrepreneurs thrive through fractional CFO services and financial education. To learn more about Clara CFO Group and how we can help your business, visit ClaraCFO. Com. Our guest today is someone I'm very honored to know and have interviewed before over on the Clara CFO Group YouTube channel. Today's guest is Greg Crabtree. With over 40 years of in-depth experience, Greg is recognized for being a public speaker, author, and entrepreneur. He is known for working with his clients on cash flow planning, business consultations, strategic planning, facilitation, success planning, and transaction advisory services. Greg is the author of Simple Numbers, Straight Talk, Big Profits. I'm going to show it to you, to you here, as well as Simple Numbers 2.0. also have that book here. And he has also contributed to Vern Harnish's book, Scaling Up, which you'll find behind me on my shelf over here. <laughs> um, Greg is also, he also chairs the EO Wharton Executive Education Program. I very much appreciate you being here, Greg. Well, glad. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm ha happy to always share. Uh insights and appreciate what you guys are doing for your, for your clients in the community. Well, we very much appreciate you and your books. I recommend every single entrepreneur read the Simple Numbers Straight Talk book. It has been hugely beneficial to um, just even the structure of how we talk to clients. It gives us a lot of language for things that you know maybe we knew to be true and how we saw businesses run, but bringing the language to it is huge. So we really appreciate that. Really appreciate that. Thanks. So I, okay. So we've already done an interview before. You can, everybody can find that over on the Clara CFO group YouTube channel. Thank you so much for coming back and sharing some more information with us. Um, I talked a little bit about like your history and where you came from and everything on that. So we're going to let people go and listen to that. I want to jump into a question, um, which is very important to me. And I'd like to hear your perspective on it. Why do you like simplicity when it comes to finances? Well, it came from studying my, my entrepreneurial clients who were successful and the ones who weren't successful too. You know, you, I mean, I always say, you know, when all else fails, you can always serve as the bad example. You know? And so uh, you learn from those as well. But, you know, when, I, when you get in the head of, of entrepreneurs that just did it and, you know, and it didn't come from opinion financial statements, it didn't come from perfect bookkeeping, it didn't come you know, from, you know, some incredible, complex Venn diagram strategy. You know, it was just a simple entrepreneur that understands the handful of things that matter. Now, you know, you, you still pay attention to those things in the periphery, but but at the end of the day, it was it's always been two or three key things that just flash big time. And, and everybody, you know, th there's a, there's a type of an entrepreneur that gravitates to the details and then they just never get out of the weeds. And there's times that entrepreneurs that, you know, they want simplicity, but they're just focused on the wrong things, you know, that are simple. And, and, and I really just started listening to them and trying to put in framework because they were not financially trained, so they couldn't talk accounting. But, you know, when you dig deep and say, what are you looking at? You know, what, what is it? Why, why do you, why'd you make this decision? And why did you do this? And, and the really good entrepreneurs, you know, just could connect the dots to these three or four key things in every business venture that they did. And so 
there's plenty of people who just don't have that intuitive feel that it says, okay, if I can take, you know, the other middle, that 60% of the entrepreneurs in the middle and elevate their game by teaching, giving them a construct that doesn't come naturally to them, but if they buy into it and believe it. And a lot of it is belief. I mean, you do have to believe, you know, something. And, and I always complain. I mean, I think one of the things that they didn't teach us in accounting training is what to believe about what the numbers tell us. Hmm. You know, they, they just give us this antiseptic, you know, debits on the left and credits on the right and assets on the left and liabilities and capital on the right. And, you know, and yeah, every trial balance has to balance. Okay, th those are good constructs. What's it mean? You know, and they didn't actually teach us in the sense that business is dynamic and it's constantly, it's never still. I mean, right. it's moving. And, you know, we haven't evolved financial understanding or reporting since Pacioli invented it in the 1400s. You know, and so, you know, we, we need to come to a different understanding of the flow of data and the movement of data and the movement of business. And, you know, and a lot of times I do, it, it is difficult to describe, you know, people ask me all the time, well, what do we do in, in simple numbers? And so, mm -hmm. well, you know, I wish it was, I wish it was a simple you know, definition, you know, but, but in, in essence, it is a, we want to be able to tell you the story of what has happening, what's currently happening and what's going to happen unless you change your actions. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you know is probably about as simply as I can state it. And that comes with a sense of understanding of what are those two or three key drivers on the P&L side of the business? What are the two or three key drivers on the balance sheet side of the business? And then what are these key things in the marketplace? So we've become much more students of the, the real market that's going on. And as, I, as we were chatting before, you know, one of the things that because we have a singular way that we see all the data, it makes it easy for us to aggregate information. And so we have a, a, a market model that we call our simple numbers 100 company model. And so we take 100 companies, it's a little over a billion of revenue. So, so average, a little over 10 million of revenue, you know, per company, but some are bigger, some are smaller. But our clients are all over the U.S. that's in that model. We have international clients as well in Canada and in Australia, you know, but we keep those out of the model because they're, uh, they're all, although we could put them in the model because they actually act ex exactly, you know, Canada's economy and Australia's economy literally is just almost exactly like ours. And it's mm -hmm. not even funny. And so, but we, we put these uh, companies in the model. And then we just track it and just like we're looking at a conglomerate that's a billion dollar business and say, okay, what is, what is it doing? What has it done? What is it currently doing? And then where, where do we see it headed, you know, based on momentum. Um, and it's fascinating, you know, to really see that because it's, it's a different story than what the government's data says, because I've always, you know, everybody's listening to this. It's a business owner that you own a private business. What does the government know about what's going on in your business in 2023? Here we are in December of 2023, almost the year's done. They know nothing, right? Nothing. How do they produce economic statistics, economic data when they don't know what happened in your business? And the truth is, is they take publicly available data and make wild ass guesses about what happens in the private market. And I'm going to contend that in the last, especially the last 20 years, it's got away from them. Mm -hmm. They don't know. We have become a much more public or private company dominant economy in the U.S. than a public company, largely because of private equity is now available for private companies. You don't have to go public to get liquidity. And, and so the private companies are, that do not have public reporting of information you know, we are the, the dominant driver. We're probably 60 yeah. plus percent of the economy from data that I've seen. Right. Um, yeah. And so, I, and, and, and as I said to you, we're also in a totally different time. We're, you can't make a general statement about the economy and it'd be meaningful. Mm -hmm. you, every one of us has our economy and our economy. We have to look at our economy and say, what are our prospects? Is it growing? Is it declining? Is it stable? 
What's my access to labor? Am I interest sensitive? Um, you know, what's my competitors doing? And in, in our data is pretty overwhelming that the overall market is not growing. Mm -hmm. uh, revenues may be up, but, mm, you know, it's wages are up equal to or greater than revenues. Right. You know? So, yeah, we're yeah. seeing that a lot, too. Yeah. And so and, and I get it. I mean, I, I'm going to give the data people some some slack because how do you measure GDP in a primarily service based economy? I mean, mm -hmm. I mean you, you could say hours. Well, I got news for you. Last time I watched a human do something, you know, every hour is not a unit of output because, you know, it, it, I always like to say in simple numbers, we have a, a rule. You cannot mix labor with something that's not labor. So that's a hard rule in simple numbers accounting. And the reason is labor is the only cost that comes to work every day with an attitude. It, it has good days and it's got bad days, but it is not a constant output, you know, Correct. cost. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and so therefore I, I get the challenge that they have, you know, but, uh, but still at the end of the day, I've got to make some reasonable judgments about what is moving. There are some things that are falling, but not many. But there's a lot more inflation probably than the government's reporting. But I'm perfectly fine with them lying to themselves about what it is because it's going to help bring interest rates down probably a little bit. Yeah. Take some pressure so. off there. <laughs> yeah. So that'd be, good, that'd be a good thing. Okay. So this um, this 100 company report that you do, mm -hmm. uh, do you have certain key metrics that you're tracking for each of the companies that created all apples to apples? What are some of those metrics? Yeah. So first and foremost, we, we look at, the overarching trend of is our revenues declining or falling. Right. And so right now, the last update we have is through October and through October that those hundred companies were actually down 2.1% over the previous mm -hmm. year when they were up the previous year, uh, by about 16%, you know, and, and so is that now, year over those, year, like year October year. to October. Okay. The, the 12, the 12 months of revenue ended October of 23 compared to the 12 months of revenue ended 22 down 2.1 percent and that's not inflation adjusted okay and there's yeah. been there i mean and, and now we influence I, i'm going to accept the fact that we influence these companies by what we tell them uh we push price increases we've been pushing it hard right and so so a lot of these companies have raised prices and one of the things we actually look at is one of the tenets of, of simple numbers is well Revenue is fine to look at, but it's a fantasy number. Revenue, revenue, I mean, it's just the starting point of math. The real number is gross margin. And so gross margin is actually uh, just fractionally, I mean, just a percentage of tenth of a percent up. And so, so at least the companies that have had declines in revenue, they've recovered in gross margin, which is more important. So they've adjusted prices and and they they've stabilized you know mm -hmm. you know from that standpoint. Now, when you take that and go deeper, so we've started doing this this separate analysis where we take that hundred companies and say, okay, let's let's isolate the companies that are actually up year over year versus the companies that are down year over year. And what does that tell us? Yeah. And so two thirds of the market is up year over year, and they're up about seven and a half percent. The mm -hmm. previous year they were up twenty two percent, so that tells you just how hot you know that that market was. Consistent profitability, uh, actually moving slightly up. So those are all the companies that are generally what I call the necessaries. They are businesses like HVAC companies, IT MSPs, uh, electricians, plumbers, um, uh, you know any anything that where service is a must you cannot postpone it you have yeah. to have it now some professional services so it's pretty heavy pro services uh, a few products that are probably core and necessary as well the other group the one third that's down they're down 16 percent this year yeah. or last year i mean significant down now one of the overarching big flashing red lights in both groups though is management labor efficiency so when we look at after COGS and after direct labor, we get the contribution margin. That's the numerator. Management labor is the denominator. That management labor efficiency is falling in, in both groups, which tells us that, and, and this, this is the overarching 
theme that we're just pounding with every client right now is you have to find a way to get more margin managed by the same management dollars. Mm. And, and so, you know, you can take a really expensive person and split it into two less expensive people or, um, you know, get rid of one person and have more one, you know, it, there's a thousand different ways you can do it, but the dollars are the dollars. And what we're finding is we're, we've seen a crash in management labor efficiency in the group that's falling because they're not trimming their management labor fast enough. Some of them are trying to throw management labor at it, thinking that that's going to lift it. And the problem is you're throwing money at that part of the market is what we call the discretionaries. And so those are the ones, and there's a food chain in discretionary. You can be a highly desired discretionary. You can be a, I can do without discretionary. Yeah. And, and the highly desireds, they're stable, but they're not, they're not thriving. They're not crazy, you know, going over the top, but the, the, the less desirable, the ones that you can postpone or do without, you're losing a lot of energy that there, there's a couple of those clients in that group that I'm really concerned that they're, they're like this close to becoming unviable as a business. Right. We yeah. have, we, and, we saw that this past year, especially with marketing, yeah. marketing, branding, um, mm -hmm. where it's not super critical that some of this, like maybe not marketing, but some, some budgets got pulled, even projects well, that were planned were paused or delayed. That's right. Uh, yeah. That's right. And, and, and to speak on marketing, because we're huge fans of effective marketing. Right. We're, yeah. We're not fans of un ineffective marketing spend. Exactly. And Same. our, whereas when the marketplace was growing, people would surge marketing spend to then see if it, if they did actually measure. A lot of people there actually never measured it. But we do, but, and they would surge marketing spend and see if it helped. Right now, the bigger trend is people are turning off marketing spin to see if it matters. Right. And the over, overwhelming result so far is it, it, isn't, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, and now they're not turning it off completely, but, but they are, they're really trimming it down. And depending on the market that you're in, you can throw all the marketing money you, you want. And if there's no fish in the pond to catch, you're just wasting money. And you got to wait until conditions, you know, you know, you know, change or or improve. So a good example, you know, clients that are interest rate sensitive business models like uh, real estate sales or mortgage uh, companies. We got clients in both of those industries. You can throw all the marketing money you want. There's there's not really that many houses being sold. Exactly. And yeah. if there's not houses being sold, there's not mortgages being done. And there'll be some refis that'll pop out if we get a little bit of rate relief here in the next month or two. And that, that'll certainly help the mortgage industry. But they, our clients in that industry have laid off significant amounts of people just to stay in the game. But, yeah. you know, they live through that. I mean, they're, you know, it's been, they've had, a, they've had the longest positive run in both of those industries, you know, since 2009 you know, that, that they've had. But they're, they're, they're having to go through the reset, you know, at, at, at the moment. Uh, yeah. But other industries, you know, you, you just got to look at those. And, you know, I'm really worried about our retail clients because retail is getting tough because, you know, as much as we all love to go buy stuff online, every online purchase that could have been bought from a physical store in your area, you're damaging the future of that store's ability to be in business when you would like to buy it from them. And so I, I remind my wife all the time when, you know, you know, she's shopping on something and like she was looking at buying a pair of shoes, you know, that, you know, one of our local, local retailers, you know, carry. And I said, you know, and she said something about buying it online. I said, well, if you want that store to be in business, the next time you'd like to get one or go down and try them on, uh, you need to buy it from them Yeah, uh, because <laughs> it, it's, it's just the way it works. And 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 I really, if you look at the nature of retail centers and shopping centers and those things, you know, it, it's getting to where the the small shop owner is, is a is going by the way of the dodo bird. I mean, it, it just they 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 cannot get enough margin past the cash register to cover the cost of labor, which is continuing to increase. Yeah. And in what the rent is <laughs> and and that's. And what's amazing is people are still charging rent like crazy, even though the center is half empty, you know? Right. And, and, and so I, it's amazing to me how they're, they're keeping those rates propped yeah. up. Yeah. It's but, not but those, a yeah. Those are the tale, tale of two different, those are tales yeah. of two different 
two, two different economies. Yeah. Now, the other thing is, is, you know, um, the good news is there's no unemployment anywhere. I, uh, you know, here's a, here's a party challenge. You know, when you're get together, at, you know, for the holiday parties, ask somebody, Hey, do you actually know anybody who's unemployed personally that, I mean, like really unemployed that they can't find a job to feed their family unemployed, not yeah. I'm waiting for a management position unemployed. Right. Yeah. I was yeah. like, I did meet somebody at a holiday party who was unemployed, but it was, she was looking for the right opportunity and I That's think right. she could have gotten a job anywhere, that, but that person, yeah. that person's not hungry. Right. There's plenty of, <laughs> there's plenty of jobs still. And, yeah. you know, and the thing is, is we have a finite workforce that is flat to actually declining in, in probably real terms. And and so you're not going to have an expanding economy, in my opinion. I mean, I, hey, what do I know? I'm a chicken farmer from Alabama that figured out a few things about numbers. But this chicken farmer is going to tell you that when you don't have an expanding workforce, you can't have an expanding economy. Mm. So just just put it out there, challenge it all you want. But, uh, you know, and you say, oh, what about AI? Really? You want to talk about AI? All right. So here's the thing. You know, our signature labor efficiency ratio, when we look at total labor efficiency, so look at gross margin numerator divided by all labor. I don't care if it's direct or management, just take all labor. That number in the in the hunter company model averages about 1.8 to 1.85. Um, if you and that that's because there's good and bad companies in that model. We don't we don't only put the good ones in there. If you if you take out the the bottom 20 performers in that, it actually gets back to the number I talk about two. Yeah. You know, you get two, you know, the 90 plus percent of the businesses in, in business operate off of one economic standard. I need $2 of gross margin for every dollar of labor. The rest of it's noise. So you want to talk about simple numbers. That's about as yeah. simple as I can get it. So what's interesting is let's go back 20 years. You, you think there's been some some advancements in process improvement and technology gains and those things in the last 20 years? Yeah, absolutely. You know what total LER would have been two, 20 years ago? Two. Two. <laughs> well, let's go back. Let's go back 40 years. You know what do you think LER would have been 40 years ago? Two. Here's the thing. We always you'll get a temporary gain when you are the innovator, and and you make that gain but you won't be able to keep it within six months to a year. The market figures it out. They compete against you. Somebody breaks rank and starts lowering prices. Yeah. There's, there's a really good inflation chart, you know, that shows the things that went up in value and the things that went down. And what's interesting is everything that has become more affordable in the last 20 years since the year 2000, are all things that are products and mostly things that require very little labor or it was, it's been imported from overseas. Everything that is significantly more expensive in the last 20 years is labor. Any, you know, medical services, professional services, lawn services. I mean, you, I mean, you name it, anything that requires humans to do something. And, and there's a lot of those human things that you talk about AI all you want, but it, you know, you, you know, they're, they're, you know, is that, is that AI going to come in and fix my toilet? Mm -hmm. you know, they're going to, you know, repair my car. And yeah, and there's a lot of technology in cars. Yeah. But I, last time I checked, I got my car service. It, you know, that, that number keeps going up <laughs> no matter yeah. what the technology is. So. Well, I think that's good for our service-based business, business owners that are listening because there's always going to be an opportunity for real labor and somebody's going to want to pay for that. I think like in the accounting services in particular, what I know is, is I'm seeing like the influx of AI and, you know, machine learning and different things that will probably take over some of that lower level transactionary, like transactional work, mm -hmm. which would be great because then it would la leave labor to actually yeah. be interpreting, advising, yeah. like yeah. giving, you know, what's the next step? What are the mm -hmm. things that takes like the human touch versus the stuff oh, that can be done absolutely. by machines? Absolutely. I mean, everything I did my first year out of, of out of college in accounting is no longer done by a human. Right. So, I mean, uh, that that's always that that's been gone for a long time, and and so now, you know, some of that is still a little bit, you know, like automatic classification of expenses and some of those things. 
Yeah, but it's kind of like having having AI write an article. You know, it, it'll write an article that looks really good. It's just totally bogus. Right. <laughs> you know, so and and so there again, I mean, I, I'm worried about people accepting automatically done things when they're they're really not been verified. And yeah. now the, the in some cases it doesn't matter. In some cases it really matters. And, and so, and, and that's what we're starting to find out is especially marketing, my marketing clients have been the most active in utilizing AI to do content creation. Um, and, you know, and, and they're, they're struggling with the fact that some of their people that are deploying that are not rigorously editing what AI produces. And yes. I always warn people that, you know, when it comes to content, I, ideation and some of those things i think is great i mean it really does kind of help you you know get get out of the 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 stuck mode you know but but you know i i can tell you after editing two books you know it it's a slog because that's not what my natural skill set is and man you know it, it's kind of the last thing i want to do you know that day and but i got to do it to keep the project moving and you know and you know and it's like your brain's hurting and and, and that, I mean, probably the most exhausting thing about writing both books was the editing phase of it, mm. not not the writing phase. So. Yeah, I could understand that. I want to ask you a question about um, <clears throat> you talk about the phase in the Simple Numbers book. You mentioned that the time between or when the when a business gets to be between like two and three point mm. five million, yeah. that it becomes mm. one of the most challenging stages in profitability. We have a lot of clients actually right now in that bucket mm -hmm. of yeah. um, size where, and so I was wondering if you could talk about why, why yeah. you're seeing so that. It's, it's a real simple, simple reason. Now, so one of the things, let, let's do a refining clarification of that and say, now, right, I've, I've got to be more about gross margin, folk, that gross margin is really, that dollar gross margin is the true measure of value creation for the thing you do in a business. Mm -hmm. And and so if you're a, a high pass through kind of business, you could be in, you know, if you're a $10 million business with a $3 million gross margin, you're still in the black hole. Right. Know, because I, I'm not looking at that 10 million top line number. I'm looking at that 3 million gross margin number because that's, that's really the service value. So if you're a $10 million contractor with, three million dollars of gross margin okay you're really a three million dollar services business in, so in real quick we'll make sure so revenue minus cost of service or cost of goods sold equals but, gross margin so right. for anybody it, listening but not but not counting direct labor, direct labor. yeah we're going to keep right. labor out of that but for for businesses right. for we have some marketing people listening mm -hmm. so if they if your direct costs might be um, you're paying, you know, for your ad buys, for example, for your clients, yep, you know, exactly. uh, you might bring in a hundred thousand dollars and then turn around and, se and send that hundred thousand dollars back mm -hmm. over to the ad. Um, so we want to take out all of that and just you, look at that after those costs. Yeah. yeah. And, and like in uh, one of the common things in marketing now is white labeling other yes. people's services yeah. and those things. So if those people the aren't on your payroll, build. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you filter those out. So this is what your team is adding value to do. Yes. And and so the reason being you can you can I, I call it the, the the stages of entrepreneurial mitosis. So mm -hmm. when you start a an, an as an entrepreneurial business, you're a single cell amoeba. You are the head of the business. You head up sales, marketing, operations, finance, HR, IT, and sweep the floors. Yeah. And and so the but the first stage of entrepreneurial mitosis is where you have to hire someone to either directly own operations or own marketing and sales of the business, driving the business development effort of the business. And that that to me is the critical stage. And when you and, and the data is overwhelming when we track this with our clients, invariably. When the client when the owner, the founder of the business chooses operations instead of marketing and, and sales, business development, the business typically gets stuck. And it's not to say it's impossible to hire sales help. There are ancillary stories out there, but they're just rare. They're, they're in the, that one out of 10, one out of 20 category of success. And so, hey, 
you know, when it comes to betting, do you want to go the long odds? Or do you want to go the more likely odds? And I don't care if you like it or not, you got to get past the black hole and stay in the ownership. Now you can hire other people to help you. You can, you don't have to do every piece of it. You just have to own it. And, and so once you get through that and you get to a size and stability, then there's other people that can sell and carry on. You're more of a enterprise than you as the founder and the persona, you know, the business. And I get it, you know, Michael Gerber, I think probably did as much damage as good when he said, you know, you need to work on your business instead of in it. Well, yeah, later, but I, there's a lot of work in the end, you know, that, and, and I, I've seen people take that phrase and just destroy a really good business because, I mean, there's only so much strategy you can do when you're yeah. that small. I mean, <laughs> come on, you know, set your strategy and then go execute. Mm-hmm. And, you know, but it's like, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta stay in it. And, and so I think as you get through that point, but the reason why you get to this inflection point, so that, that single cell amoeba entrepreneur can manage up to two to 3 million, really, when you kind of get to that two and a half is where everything s- starts to come apart. And so at that point, you have to decide, can I get past 3 million and get to four and realistically get to five. This is where we have a really hard, honest discussion with clients. When you're at two and a half million dollars of gross margin, do you have the market potential for what you're doing to get to five? And if you don't stay, you, you, you basically try to create a very high profit niche business that intentionally stays below three million. Because you can manage it that way. And you can be really proud. We had a, a consulting practice that worked with dentists that they were at two and a half million, making 750000 a year in profit when everybody's making a market wage it, it, on top of that. You know, so really good business. And they wanted yeah. to get to five, they wanted to get to five million. And there was five million available, but it would be a lot harder. And they and and so I, I modeled out what five million would look like to them, but they would only make at best, at best, a million in profit instead of seven fifty. And I said, "Here's your choice." They yeah. agreed with they agreed with my assessment of the model, and they go, "I think we'll stay at two 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 and a half million." And yeah. and they they understood because the other thing is is when you start having to make more aggressive sales to get into that size of the market, I mean you're the law of the big starts to, to set in. The more activity you get, the less profitable you become, not more profitable. It really takes extreme skill as an entrepreneur to maintain your rate of profitability as you get bigger. And one out of 20 maybe accomplish that. But mm. you don't get more profitable as you get bigger. You get, as a rate, uh, you, you get less profitable. And, and, and once, once we show those people in dollars, was this what you mean? They go, oh, well, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe let's let's do this. Let's get really profitable in in what we got, and it's it's better than. I mean, your your ego is tied up into that revenue number, and it's like just park that at the curb, buddy. You know, yeah. I mean that that's that that's not what pays the bills. That's why we need to keep that that profit number in. It always in our sites rather than the revenue because the revenue like is is the vanity number. Um, I I I was recently at a conference where a firm owner put up their numbers onto a slide, which I was kind of surprised they did that. Mm-hmm. But it was something like twelve million million dollars in top line revenue. They had one hundred and fifty people, and their profit was eight percent. And I was like, ooh, for eight percent, I could have mm-hmm. a much smaller business for the same dollar amount of profit. If yep. I manage a business much more efficiently and Absolutely. I could have a manage a lot fewer people <laughs> and it it was kind of a very good aha moment for me yep. to go. I don't want to be that. I don't, I don't want to go after that. That's not a goal of mine. Mm-hmm. And I think that is good for everybody to remember that sometimes shrinking is not the wrong right. choice to yep. be able to maintain the profit that really makes sense for you. Well, in, in, and now's the perfect market to come to that realization, you know, because, you know, the the 20 years leading up to, um, 
you know, COVID and really in, into COVID. Um, but it really is leading up to 2020. That 20 year period from 2000 to 20 is, was, you know, I call it the participation trophy economy. The economy was expanding at such a rapid rate, far, far faster than the government reported. So this was a case where they missed it on the other side. Mm. that the, the economy was expanding at an incredibly rapid rate. And we, we saw double digit growth in our clients from 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Single digit growth in 19. And the reason we ran out of labor, that was 2019 before COVID was where we started to have skilled labor being poached by other people because they couldn't find it in the market. And you know what wages started to escalate. And then COVID hits and throws all of our, our sense off the trail, you know, that we, we just can't follow things, you know, like we could. But as we started, we kept looking at it and we're going, no, no, well, this is an economy that is totally out of labor. And then, you know, I started studying some of the, the um, you know, the, the population demographic data closer, you know, got turned on to some of Peter Zahn's data, you know, with, with his, his stuff. And it's like, oh, crap. I mean, this, this, this is the reason why. This is, and it ain't getting better, folks. Uh, you know, when you've got a 1.6 and declining birth rate, um, I got news for you. This is pretty much hard baked in for the next generation. You know, like next 20 years. I mean, there is just there's. I mean, and unless we kind of woke up and decided to do some really aggressive, skilled immigration to bring people in, you could expand mm-hmm. the economy doing that. I mean, that is the one way to expand it. But politically, that's never going to happen. You know, and, and so therefore, you know, we've, we've got to look at the market that we have. And so it, you may have a few businesses grow that are in geographic areas where people are migrating to. So that's, that is one way that there will be some growth. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, hopefully you got the labor to be able to do it. Most of us are going to have to deal with the addressable market as it is. And we're now in what I refer to as the street fight economy. You got to go take your fist and punch your competitor in the mouth and take their customer away from them. That's how you grow. And we haven't been in that kind of marketplace in a long time. Interesting. And, do, you see, do you think that even in small business, though? Because I find that competitive. Uh, I, I find that in the small business space, it seems like there are there is room for most. Of the small businesses, but I'm I'm. I don't see well, a lot of aggressive marketing tech or ag- aggressive like sales tactics, I guess, like that. Well, there's reasons for that. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's the fact that, you know, there, the aggression over the last 20 years, we've also been lulled into passive marketing versus active selling. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that we've lost in the last 20 years is the skill set of an active salesperson who really knows how to find a target cultivate the target, close the sale. Mm -hmm. Now, part of that is I'm going to argue that that's a blend of marketing and sales pulled into one position, you know, but certain industries have always kind of had that because that's just how it works. You don't win things by social media or general marketing, you know, but there's a lot of businesses that stopped doing active selling and thought that their passive marketing and social media presence and all that stuff was working. Because the reality was, no, the market was expanding at such a, a rapid rate. You were just being handed sales. But next man up, who's available mm-hmm. you know, to, to do the work? And now it's like, well, that next new customer isn't showing up. And so you've got to go dislodge a not ready to leave customer that, I mean, things aren't bad enough for them to leave the the. The, you know the current provider that they have and so I, I i i can't just rely on passive marketing messages to generate that unrest to get them to move mm. and 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 we've lost a lot of sales skill set you know in the last 20 years you know mm-hmm. because of that uh, and and i i think there, there's got to be a renaissance i think of a, a, a new active selling capabilities and techniques and training the, the challenge is it's not a job that a lot of young people want to go into. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, I actually saw a kid the other day that actually, you know, just graduated. One of my EO friends, uh, his his son was at an EO event with him and he's actually in sales with AT&T in, in Dallas. And it's like, cool. I said, kid, you'll do great. 
<laughs> you know, and I mean, and he had the right mindset and the right personality. I mean, so he'll 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 do incredibly well. You know, yeah. but but uh, you know, but we do have we we do have some disconnects in terms of the available people in the workforce, what they're willing to do and not willing yeah. to do. Uh, and and I think it's once again, you can't make a general statement. You've got to look at your your part of the economy. And I, and I'll give you just kind of a, a data point. So one of the the mastermind groups that we manage is a HVAC group that's you know it's about a hundred million dollars of revenue of the companies that are in that group and and so to give you kind of a data point I mean number one the world is not overrun with available HVAC techs so let me just I, I can make that right. statement pretty pretty <laughs> assertively so there's not enough tech talent you know for the demand these companies have increased revenue 45 percent over three years their labor costs have gone up 45% over three years. They're not do, they don't employ any more people than they employed as a group than three years ago. A few of them are up a, point, a person or two, a few of them are down a person or two. The group in total, they're the same. So that tells you that is a necessary skill set service that just continues to raise prices relative to what the cost input is because the market will let them do it because there's scarcity. But for the people, the, the the people that I'm worried about being unviable in business are the people that their costs keep going up, but they can't change the revenue number. I see that too. Yep. And and so and and if you and and the good if you look at medical services where insurance caps what you can you can't change your price. Yes. But your costs keep rising. Uh -huh. There's going to be a collapse in denial of service. That that is the first thing, and and, and there's been a little sub segments within the medical industry that has collapsed, uh, yeah. and and service has gone away. We've seen that in um, therapy practices as well. Mm -hmm. So right. um, you know, therapists want to get paid more and more and more, and then the reimbursement rates are down, 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 down. You know, that can happen in like physical therapy. It can happen with, um, yeah. you know, with speech therapy, yeah, we, all of those types of things. We, we do a decent amount of work in the uh, the, the PT, uh, uh, physical therapy, chiropractic space. Mm -hmm. And in the in the push there, there's a group, a consulting group that works with those kind of practices we work, do a lot of work with. And and we're both aligned. We really encourage those practices to go private, go private pay, you know, forget about insurance and just build your practice on a cash pay model. And, and, um, you know, and, and I, I know a lot of times, you know, people think, oh, I can't get big. Well, you want to be big and broke. I mean, you right. know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but when you, when you don't control your revenue, yeah. you are in this marketplace, you're running a really dangerous model. So, well, I'm glad we're aligned there <laughs> because yeah. I've, I've had the exact same yeah. conversations with people. But, but you, but the, the other one that I use as kind of a teaching, you know, example is the restaurant industry. You, you're going to see a constant, probably bottom 20, 30 percent of the restaurant market in every city turn over over the next five years. And, and the reason being, you've got three types of, of errors in the restaurant industry. You've got the, the, the people who refuse to pay what the market needs to get a decent worker. And so they, they fail in service. Customers don't like it. Well, restaurants traditionally have no reserves. So if a restaurant is unprofitable for 30 to 60 days, they go out of business. I mean, they're, they're, they're gone fast. There's, there's nothing there to backstop them. And so that group goes out. Well, the group says, okay, well, I got to pay the right wage. So I'll get this. Well, I just can't raise my prices. Well, you can't be profitable. So you go out of business. Mm -hmm. The next group says, okay, I can ra I'll, I'll, I'll raise the wages. I'll raise the price. And then the customer says, it ain't worth that. Yeah. And now some people can get away with it, but man, you know, when you go to five, I, I love five guys hamburgers and, you know, I don't know if they're in your market or not, yeah. but you know, down, down here, you know, I, I'm, that's my, that's my go-to, but it's $18 for a hamburger fries and a drink. And it's like, okay, I like it. I'm not going to eat it every day. And th th there, there gets to be a point that I worry that, and and I, I appreciate that that's what their labor cost is, and that's what it's going to be. But the marketplace starts to look at those things, and then you start to to make adjustments. And some people will adjust by just making more money. And guess what that means? Everybody else has to raise their prices because if 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 this is if 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 I make this a core cost that I must have, you know, then you know it it pushes you know in another place. 
Yeah. Um, it's it's still surprising that the bottom end of the wage market, which has had, you know, you, we've gone, the, the guy making $13 an hour pre-COVID is now making 20 to 25, more than likely. That, that's about a 65% wage increase in a three-year period. That, that is massive. But those people are still running out of money at the oh, end yeah. of their paycheck. Yeah, still and, not enough to and, live. <laughs> and th those things will continue, you know. And, and so I think this is yeah. the interesting time that everybody, we, we don't have, we have a stable economy in the sense that everybody's employed. We don't have a stable economy that prices and some things will continue to move, but mostly up. A few things will get cheaper before they disappear. Because mm -hmm. here's the thing. When something starts to get cheaper, just, just remember I said this, uh, they, they, they get cheaper right before they're no longer available. <laughs> so <laughs> so don't, don't be surprised that, you know, that, that product or service is, is no longer there. Because mm. that's what a labor-starved economy. Uh, there, there was a great article in the Wall Street Journal last year that was an expose of Latvia, and mm. and they it is it is the picture of the future of a labor-starved economy where people don't stay when the, the kids there grow up. Many of them leave, but there's not enough people in the economy to do everything that people want to have done. And so there's just denial of service of things. Interesting. And so it's, you know, so it, it's, it's that thing to kind of keep an eye on and you'll see it in kind of, I, I think you'll see it first in the U S in the areas that are declining in population first you know, yeah. in, in, in the South, we pretty much have, you know, increasing population because of migration, but Mississippi's losing people and Louisiana's losing people. So it's not universal in the South. You know, not every place is growing. Yeah. Very interesting. I didn't think we were going to talk so much about um, economics in this podcast interview, but I'm really glad we did because yes. I think it is good to step back sometimes and like think about the big picture and where does your business fit in this kind right. of changing labor market and how how can you survive and you have to be able to adapt because and, and this does happen where we have business owners who may have owned their business for 20, 30 years and then they might be getting to a place where they're going, why is it not working now? Yep. And you might need to look at some of these bigger picture um, yeah. situations. And, and like I said, it's not about the economy. It's about your economy. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, and, and that, you know, those general statements, I just ignore them. They, they don't, they don't matter. Yeah. Well, um, we don't have a lot of time left, but sure. I have one last question to ask, but before I ask it, I want to point people to your website so they can learn more about you and about the simple numbers, um, framework and whatnot. So you can go to www.simplenumberscri.com if people want to go and check that out. But the last question I have for you, Greg, is who has been a mentor in your life and what is something that has stuck with you from that mentor relationship? Yeah, um, I mean, for me, I mean, I have to point to uh, uh, Warren Rustan is, is someone who I was fortunate enough to meet you know, probably 15 years ago uh, in my EO uh, journey. Uh, I, I got to serve with Warren on the first EO Leadership Academy as Warren was our dean of the academy. And I, I got to be one of the, the first facilitators, you know, for that when we launched the program uh, and got to know Warren. Warren is a uh, is just an, an incredible story, rich history. But uh, but more than the stories, Warren is just just an incredible person, you know, that, uh, you know, is the, you know, has the example of, you know, talks the talk, but walks the walk, mm. you know, kind of person. Uh, but, you know, he served in the, the uh, Gerald Ford administration as Gerald Ford's appointment secretary uh, and then uh, left and went into business, you know, after Ford left office and, uh, and he's bought and sold multiple businesses over the years. He's become a, a great mentor, many of us EOers. So I, I feel very fortunate that, uh, you know, I, I get to interact with him on a fairly regular basis, you know, with, with folks that I know and the, the clients that, that also use him uh, in, in for, for guidance. Um, but I, I mean, I, I really think the idea is, you know, Warren, it, so it goes back to, I've, I've always had a phrase, and I used this when I was on the EO Global Board. I was always kind of the last one to talk, 
because you kind of let everybody, you know, it, it's an interesting organization in terms of the way it governs, you know, and good, bad, or indifferent, you know, but you got a bunch of entrepreneurs that are used to having final say and getting what they want. And how do you, at the time we had nine board members and how do you get nine people? We generally wanted to have unanimous consent, you know, when we were making decisions and everybody would kind of give their, their say. And, you know, I'd always be kind of re- usually the last person to say something. And I'd listen to what everybody says and listen, guys, it, to me, it's pretty simple. Change what you say or change what you do. Just pick one of the two. And I said, you know, whatever we end up deciding, if we say it, let's do it. If we're not going to do it, let's don't say it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think that kind of became, you know, kind of a, a mantra and that, 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 that's kind of, you know, Warren in a nutshell. I mean, if he talks about it, he does it, you know, and if he doesn't do it, he's not going to talk about it, you know, but, but, um, but, you know, but someone who, I, I think Warren is, is either in his late seventies or maybe be 80. I, I forget how old he is, you know, but I mean, you know, Warren could pass, you know, for somebody in the mid sixties. And, and so it's also a pattern of the one of the reasons why, you know, everybody in, in, in that's one of my peers in my professions is already retired. Mm. And there's a handful of us, you know, and the managing partner of the firm I'm now part of, you know, he's, he's a couple of years older than me and he's still going too. But, you know, folks like us is like, no, I, I'm, I don't plan to retire. I might take a few more hours off and take more days off here. But you know, it's like, why would I go to the house when I, I think I'm just now starting to understand business? <laughs> and, and, and it's like taking all those experiences and starting to connect the dots and continuing to, to be involved. And, and granted, I mean, the, and the key is I get, because of the role that I have, I get to elevate to just doing those things that are super high value, yeah. uh, which is, is nice to do. You know, but, but there again, I, you know, in counseling clients, I mean, I see clients all the time that, you know, look at selling their business and those things. And I said, well, you know, yeah, there's money involved. I get that. But, um, I tell you, I, 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 I want to tell all the entrepreneurs, be careful what you wish for. Cause when you sell the business, I, I, you know, my experience tells me it's the second business. That's the hardest one to start, not the first one. And there are so many people who sold a really, really good business that should have kept it. Yeah. Because it's still, it's still worth, I mean, if it's worth that much now, it's going to be worth that much down the road unless you, you destroy it. And if you're, and as long as you're not destroying it, there's been very few businesses that were that, oh, it's just this moment in time. It's going to be worth this gazillion dollars. Mm, you know, that, that actually isn't true. Yeah. So, so I really think, you know, the idea is, is, you know, like in Warren's case, I mean, he, it, 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 he at his age, he's still quite relevant you yeah. know, to everybody that seeks him out as a mentor. And I'm, and I, I get to play that role, you know, for, you know, people in the industry as, uh, uh, as well as clients. And, you know, I, I enjoy that. And, yeah. and that's my job to, you know, kind of, kind of always, you know, have something useful to, to say and, uh, and uh, learn to be a good listener. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I thank you for being in that role. I, it's some aspirational for me too. Um, and Greg, thank you so much for being here on Financial Clarity. I appreciate the straightforward approach that you have to finances, and I know our listeners do as well. So um, besides the website that we mentioned, is there anywhere else that people can go and learn more from you? I mean, I mean, there's a ton of stuff. I mean, when I do talks, uh, a lot of times my presentations are have been videoed over the years, uh, and so I, I get a lot of comments from people that it's just if you just go to YouTube and search for Greg Crabtree, yeah, you know, I'm pretty I'm pretty easy to find. Yes, or, or do or do simple numbers, and so a lot of those presentations, some of the more detailed ones, if you want to, you know, go deeper, you know, into you know kind of the how of things. Um, you know, that's the, the, a lot of those are out there. So if people, you know, want to, uh, want to look for those, uh, but, you know, but there again, you know, I've always kind of looked at it from an agnostic standpoint of going, hey, you know, I, we put a lot of stuff out there that I'm just as thrilled when somebody has never paid us a dime to do any services for them. They, they come up and they run their business off of our concepts and that's success. Great. But there's people that need, need help and we're here to help those people to it and have happy to do that, you know, w- whenever that happens. And it's like, listen, you know, it, it, it's all about all of us kind of, uh, kind of my, my personal theme is to elevate the entrepreneur. Yeah. And, you know, 
it, it, it all works, you know, when you try to do that and, you know, there's, there's time to make money from it. There's time to share it for free and there's time to, you know, to, to pass it on to the next person. And, and I think the more that we take that kind of mindset, there's, there's enough in this for all of us. We, we, none of us are going to look, look far to find something to do every day. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with that approach. That's why we have a podcast. That's why we do the YouTube channel as well. And I really appreciate, you know, the, the resources that you've put out into the world as well. So if anybody has not grabbed these books, please make sure you can get them. You can find them on Amazon really easily. We'll make sure that those are available in the show notes as well. So Greg, thank you so much for being here. All right. Thank, thanks, Anna. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Financial Clarity Podcast. Be sure to check out the show notes to learn more about today's episode and click subscribe on your favorite podcast app. 